The film No Ordinary Protest presents a group of seven-year-old children who are debating on the environment and the reckless attitude of adults towards it. And that debate ignites some sort of activist spirit in them and a spirit of solidarity and they take action, which is quite imaginative and perhaps spooky. A lot of my work is concerned with how do I create a situation through my work which gives the agency to other people, in this particular case, children who are very young and they have no audible political presence. So what tools do we give the next generation and what hope do we give to them? Another aspect of the project is the theme of the environmental crisis, that we think about it and we see it from the perspective of the next generation and this is what this project is trying to do. When I was introduced to the class of seven-year-old children, I found out quite soon they were um, uh, studying a book called The Iron Man by the author Ted Hughes and uh, found out that 30 years later he had written the sequel, The Iron Woman. So The Iron Woman features a, a female superhero and she has the ability to um, receive or to hear a supernatural sound which is the howl of all the creatures on the planet who are suffering from the environmental crisis. And she gifts children with this supernatural sound who then realize they have to take matters in their hand to their hands and take action. She hears noises. It's the cries of the creatures. Where are they? Everywhere. What happened? Grown-ups poison everything. And there are key elements in that book that, are, that kind of resonate with my own practice. One, it's eco-feminist. Two, give agency to and empower young people. And three, the central element, the central feature of the book is noise. What I've been trying to explore in my work so far, including this project, is what kind of transformative power does communal sound making have? She uses noise and the children use noise in a way that brings about social change and material transformation. The way I generated sound in this film is quite different from other works. The children generate sounds using toys, musical instruments, their voices, their hands. And that's because my question to them was quite open. I asked them to imagine and somehow reproduce the noise that features in the book. <laughs> this supernatural noise you can experience it only through touch, but it's inaudible, but it's also deafening. It's an impossible sound. Using their improvisations, I created a composition. So the content of the film really developed through the workshops. I think for the children, the relationship between the book and the real is still very ambiguous. But what is real is their responses. The animal didn't do anything to the humans, so why are they poisoning them? Um, it's like a war. The shifting landscape that features in the film is a cymatic landscape. There was a plate, a metal plate, on which we had powder producing sound. We vibrated that plate. You know, the movement of sound uh, then causes this powder to move as well. Because of the way we filmed it, it looks like a vast landscape. So as the children vocalize or they vibrate the, the plate using other sounds, we see these mountains, as far as we're concerned, shifting. And this became a very important metaphor in the final film. I wanted to communicate the fact that this generation, the kind of young children, they have the power to move mountains. A lot of the props that feature in the film were made 
in collaboration with the children. So I felt that they were pushing really my aesthetic into directions that I would not have gone had I not worked with um, them. In my film, the children are running towards us, but there's something about the slow motion of it is kind of really suspended. I want to make a connection between that and the time that it takes for them to actually become strong voices when we have to actually give them answers. And I don't think we're ready for it.